expanding your knowledge. It's, it's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, we've been talking about um, expanding past our boundaries, and we've covered a lot of stuff in expanding past. I think there's three sermons on the one expanding past your boundaries. So um, if you've missed anything, this series of expansion will go on for some more, ti- for some more time. So uh, if you've missed any, don't miss it. You don't have to miss them. They're on our website, lpcc.org. Um, and review them and look at them. So you don't have to miss anything. It isn't like, well, you missed two Sundays and now you don't know what's going on. Well, you really can catch up. So uh, think of it as like Netflix binge watching or something, you know, like you can get it all. Um, so expanding your knowledge. I think that's a real big thing for us in our culture today is expanding our knowledge. Um, our text today is in Proverbs eighteen fifteen. I got a couple of versions for you to look at, two or three versions, in fact. Um, an intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Wise men and women are always learning, always listening for fresh insights. That's what the message says. And intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. That is uh, New Living Translation. I like to think of myself as being, well, somewhat intelligent. <laughs> Don't laugh. Not everybody laughs. But. So I'm always really wanting to learn, and I, and I like that uh, it's in the Bible. Because if it's important, it's in the Bible. Um, so if, if knowledge is in the Bible, and it's in there a lot, in fact, uh, in Proverbs, it's in there like 50 times of the 200 times. So 25% of when we talk about knowledge is sitting in Proverbs. Um, it's in the Word. Uh, why is it important to expand your knowledge? Why is it important? Or is it important? I, I remember uh, as a time, as a, young, uh, as a young church attendee in Sunday school and, and uh, uh, early, you know, late 60s, early 70s, um, it, it was a little bit frowned upon within our denomination if you were too smart. And it, and it really came from a complete pendulum swing of uh, Pentecostals and Pentecostalism didn't root from the intellectuals. It didn't come from academia. It came from experience. It came from spending time in the altar. It came from from praising and worshiping God. It didn't really come from book knowledge. It came from experience. So at, at one point in our, in our history, uh, we were kind of frowned on like, well, you know, that's, that's for the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians and, you know, those people. They can, they can get all those, you know, MDivs and DDivs and all that stuff. Uh, but we want the Holy Spirit. And somehow we convoluted the, the, the notion that the Holy Spirit and, and, um, and knowledge were incompatible. You know, you can't like have, you can't have one without the other. I'm here to tell you that's not true. They, they, they are hand in hand. They, they are lockstep with each other. Um, and so we do a disservice to the word of God, and we also do a disservice to the Holy Spirit from God, and we start to try to separate that. It, it does us no, no good. So it is important to expand your knowledge. The very simplest answer is because God's word tells us that it's important. He says, exp- he's telling us to expand our hearts and our knowledge, seek wisdom. And he tells us that in not just one verse, not just two verses, not just something we can manipulate, but it's like 200 times over the course of the text uh, that knowledge is important and it's important to him. Um, we have to remember that we are always influencing. Are you an influencer? You may not be a preacher, but are you influencing? You are. If you're a dad or a grandfather or an uncle, you are influencing. And when you're influencing, 
and you're expressing your opinions and you're talking of to people, um, they're usually talking to you because they have a relationship with you or and they trust you and they trust your opinion. Because if they if they could just find the answers to their question, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna Google it. They're not even gonna bother you. They're just gonna go straight to Wikipedia or or whatever and find the answer. But if they're talking to you, you have an influence. The influence you have is not just based on what you know academically, what you've learned in books, um, what you've learned in school, um, but what you know is the culmination, the culmination of your life experience. It's your grandfather talking to you. It's your grandmother talking to you. It's your dad. It's your mom. It's your sister. It's your brother. It's your professor. It's your kids. It's your it's your college counselor. It's your youth pastor. It's the culmination of all your knowledge. So when you speak to somebody, all that is behind you. So when you talk, you're not talking just on yourself, from yourself. You're talking from your experiences and from your life, from your life education. So it's important. And, and they also are communicating to you from that. So if your experiences uh, have a little church hurt in it, what's, you know what church hurt is? Someone at the church did me wrong and I'll never forgive them kind of thing. Or, or, or someone in your family or somebody did you wrong and someone's asking counsel or advice or what you think or whatever, you don't think some of that's going to play into your opinion? You don't think some of that's not going to play into what you, what you think? Because what you think is a culmination of your life experiences. So some of the life experiences of younger people are not as, not as deep, doesn't have the depth. And some of the experiences of older people have real depth. But some of the life experiences of some of the young people may be fresh and new and great. And some of the life experiences of us older, and I'll throw myself in there, I earned every gray hair. I, I earned every bald battleship get out of my scalp loss. I earned it. But some of that's not so good. So you got to be careful. You got to weigh it out carefully. So you come in with the life experiences, you're an influencer. Whether you think you're an influencer or not, I'm telling you, you're an influencer. You're influencing your family, you're influencing your church, you influence your community. We as believers, we believe this, we believe this here at La Palma, we are a reflection of Christ. You realize when you walk out of these doors that you may be the only Jesus some people see. Uh, amen. Do you like that? <laughs> Does that bother you? For me, it's, it's, it's humbling. For me, it, it keeps me like, okay, I got to make sure I do this right. I got to make sure that I don't mess this up. Um, I always have the image of the millstone around my neck causing the, the young ones to, to stumble, right? Um, and for teachers and for, and for believers and leaders, there is, I mean, there is a higher responsibility. There is a higher judgment. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm like, okay. Um, I, and, I, and I take that with a lot of humility and trepidation. So uh, um, it's not, it's not a, I don't take it lightly. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, as a child, 12 years old, he held the priests and the teachers in awe when he was questioned, when he was questioning and answering them in the temple in Luke uh, 2, 47. In fact, what they said is they were astonished of this young man's understanding. They were astonished of a 12-year-old's understanding of the word, of the Torah. They were astonished. Um, these were learned men. These were, these were elders. They were at awe of a 12-year-old and what he had knew. Um, young people. Let 
let people be in awe of what you know from the word. You are, you are starting, but that doesn't mean that you don't know anything. As long as you have the spirit in you, you have value. And um, while I'm over here, maybe we'll talk about it later, but I'm, I just, when the spirit has called you and you are serving him, and you're and you're learning. You're, you're you're that's all you do. That's your whole life is learning, acquiring knowledge, uh, whether that be you know uh, trigonometry or learning how you know journalism or whatever it is that you're you know doing. Don't get to a point to where your faith and your knowledge and education come in conflict. Because when you go to school and you're trying to learn math or business economics and you have a professor who says you are a complete moron if you have any faith at all and there's no room for that at this table, you have to have the ability and the maturity that God has given to you in your heart to say, you know what, I came here to learn math, I came here to learn economics, but you're not teaching me my morals. You're not teaching me my, my theology. You're not teaching me about God, whether he exists or he doesn't exist. So be sure that you have complete confidence that God is with you. And if they look at you and say, you cannot be smart, you cannot be intelligent. If you believe in this Santa Claus God, stand in the faith of the experience of what God has put in your heart and the witness that you already have, so you can be a witness to those unbelievers. Don't let them have the influence on you. You have the influence on them. We're to implore to study. Paul tells Timothy in this private letter, Timothy gets two letters from Paul that we know of, that we have in the book, and they're really private letters. I mean, Paul, I don't think Paul had any intention of these two letters that he sent his, basically his um, spiritual son to encourage him to be read 2,000 years ago by 21st century Americans. Um, and he tells them, 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one that's approved a worker that need not be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. What Paul is telling Timothy is don't be ignorant. Don't get caught off guard. Study. Let God approve it. Handle the truth. Handle the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth with love, but tell the truth. Our testimony and witness can be tainted by our ignorance to the word. If we don't know what's in the word, and every wind of doctrine, everybody who comes in has an opinion in this. If we don't know what the word says, how in the world can we stand firm on his word of what is true? What is true? Well, this is the truth. But don't manipulate the truth, but also be wise enough and smart enough and have the knowledge of this that you can tell instantly when someone's off base. You just don't nod your head and grin. You just go, no, that's not what it says. Don't let people take a scripture or two verses and take them out of context and surgically remove them and make them and have them form a thought that isn't of God. Our culture does that a lot. Stand fast in the Word of God and know it. Don't be ignorant of our culture. Um, man, you have to know who you're talking to. You have to know what you're talking about, and you got to know who you're talking to. Just because you know you have wisdom of your culture, does that mean you change anything? Does it change anything? Do you change your theology because you know who your culture is? 
Are, are you going to fit the message to fit the people? If you're trying to, th if you're thinking in your mind, hey, listen, I don't want to be offensive to anybody. I got news for you. This word and the gospel is offensive. Now listen, use deodorant if you need to. Brush your teeth. You know, wear clean clothes. But certainly the word is going to be offensive because it's countercultural. Um, is it our duty to be culturally relevant? Well, I mean, I'm telling you, I got, a, I got every version you can think of on this, on this phone, um, and it relates. I could send it to anybody anywhere in the world at any time instantly. Uh, I think that's pretty culturally relevant, but there's just some things you just have to stand on the word, and the word never changes. Amen? Don't be ignorant to the spirit that lives within you. Remember, the spirit of God is in you. As we, as believers, we believe that we are a vessel. <clears throat> In fact, we believe that we are, we are kind of a cracked vessel filled with the holiness of God. Wow. And God entrusts us, these cracked, frail vessels, with this, with this Holy Spirit that, well, it's mind-blowing. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he put it in somebody else who's more worthier? But he, put, he, he gives his spirit to us. Let that spirit work in you. Let that spirit help you expand your knowledge in knowing what's right. Um, being clear going forward. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge is a dead end. Just because you know something or just because you learn something, if you don't know what to do with it, you just went to a cul-de-sac. <laughs> You've become a professional student. You know, I've met people a lot in my journey going for their second or third master's, going for a PhD. What are you going to do with it? I don't know. Do something with it because knowledge in itself is useless. It's also for us to know that knowledge of the word, you sitting in low seats, learning, 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 full of knowledge, and you don't use it, you do no one any good, especially the kingdom. Learn it, apply it. Learn it, exercise it. Um, let me tell you a little story about my own journey in, in uh, knowledge, expanding knowledge. I'm, um, I never was much of a, of a book guy, and I really wasn't much of a student. <laughs> I remember in elementary school, I was going to a, I went to a, Baptist Day School that my parents paid dearly for. Um, and I didn't really like school. My mom's coming up with all this money, and I'm, I'm going, but I'm not doing all that great. So I'm passing, I'm passing. I'm passing. I get to the fifth grade. Who wants to be smarter than a fifth grader? <laughs> well, when I was in the fifth grade, I wasn't even as smart as a fifth grader. <laughs> I had my teacher take me outside and said, hey, Jimmy, you are not gonna, you're not going to be worth anything to anybody if you don't do better. I was really hurt. But then part of me didn't really care. <laughs> like, okay, fifth grade. The other part of me was like, I'm going to prove her wrong. And so I set out to prove her wrong. <laughs> like, okay, I'll show you. Not only will I get past fifth grade, I actually might go to sixth. The mentality of a, of a child, right? So I struggled with school. I, I, I struggled with fitting in. You know, I, maybe it was just me, uh, but I, I struggled fitting in. And um, I, um, I always felt I was kind of out of sorts. 
uh, in, in a school setting. Uh, maybe I had undiagnosed ADHD or something. I don't know. Maybe I was bipolar. I have no idea. But all I know is me at school just didn't, didn't work out. I, my favorite class was recess. Okay. And then lunch. Lunch was really good, too. Um, I was kind of in a survival mode, you know. I wanted to outwit, outwit, outplay, and outlast everybody. You know, I just, I was kind of surviving. Um, and the education system was—it's really goofy. I, I graduated in '75. That would kind of give you an idea of how old I am. I graduated in '75 from Cerritos High School. Um, no honors. I wasn't cum laude. La di da da. I was none of that. Um, I mean, I, I graduated, and so, uh, and I didn't really want to go to school. I didn't want to college. My college wasn't. It. My dad was trying to go to get me to go to Annapolis, go to go to the Naval Academy because he's World War II Navy guy. And um, I said, "Listen, Dad," I said, I, "I'm not going to go in the Navy." He goes, "It'd be the best thing for you." I said. I lived in the Navy for the last 18 years. I don't have to join the Navy. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, swab the deck. I mean, I mean, I did all that. There was no other sailors to order around. I was the only one, and my dad would do that. So I, I had no interest uh, in joining the Navy. He says, if you don't go to school, if you don't go to college, uh, you'll have to pay rent. Ooh, a financial incentive. <laughs> I didn't want to pay rent. And I could take a few classes. Little did I know what I didn't know. So I go down to Cerritos College, and I take the entrance exam, you know, the little aptitude test they give you. Now, I'm, a, I'm a, like a mid, you know, I'm in the, probably the upper 20 percentile of my graduating class at Cerritos. Um, guess what I found out when I took that aptitude test? I didn't know how to read. Write or do arithmetic. <laughs> California school system. Raw. <laughs> so the first classes I took at Cerritos were bonehead math, bonehead English. Because I didn't know. I thought I knew, but I didn't know. You know what happened? I had a, I had a standard over here that said everything was good, and then I changed standards and said, no, you're not. Okay, so there's some spiritual applications to that, folks. You know, if you're, if you're living a life that says, I'm okay over here, because you don't know what you don't know, and you try to apply God's application to your life, you find out, like, you're really short. Um, so I took my, my bonehead math, my bonehead English, and I started taking some courses from the secular, from a secular college, and what I said to you young people earlier, it was profound even then. I had, uh, I had uh, U.S. history teachers trying to tell, tell me and the students, all 40 of us every hour, new batch of 40, um, that God had nothing to do with the formation of the Constitution and uh, the, all, the, all the things that we know about. Uh, faith uh, are all lies and whatever. Uh, and I was really taken back by it. Um, I was taken back by it because I had been, I had been taught in a more, in a more uh, uh, evangelical uh, bent that, you know, we, we believe the nation was founded by, by Christian men who were looking for liberty and the pursuit of happiness and religious freedom. And that never really came up. Uh, and if you would bring up your, raise your hand and go like, hey, wait a minute, I thought we, the pilgrims came over here to escape religious persecution, and uh, oh no, they came over here because they were exploiting the, the, uh, the natives, uh, the indigenous people. And so, you know, you had all these different kinds of, I didn't like it. I couldn't afford to go to private school. Uh, I wanted to go to SEC, Vanguard now because I couldn't stand this. And I still didn't want to have to pay rent to my dad. So, uh, you know, the Lord made a way. He made a way. He makes a way. 
you know, we talked about, you know, like this journey of making a way. He, he's always made a way. I've never, ever been in a place that he didn't make a way. Um, he makes a way. He made a way for me to pick up another job and work more hours in order to afford the tuition at SEC. And I graduated from there with a bachelor's. Now, God has always had a call on my life. Um, and, and anointing, let's just call it what it is. And I, uh, and I always kind of just kind of, me and God played dodgeball a lot. You know, he'd, he'd lob something at me and I'd like, whoo, you missed me. Um, he lob another thing, whoo, almost got me there. And um, I, I was, you know, but he kept, he kept, he kept lodging the balls and I kept getting like, oh, you almost got me there. Um, I ended up graduating with a bachelor's in business because uh, I wasn't one of those guys, one of those preacher guys. I wasn't going to go to school and become a preacher. I, you know, I, I, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to make millions of dollars. I'm going to pay my tithe. I was that guy. Um, I didn't make millions of dollars, but uh, I did pay my tithe. Um, he blessed me. and we've had, a, we've had a great, great life in, in serving God. 12, 13 years ago or so, um, I changed jobs. Uh, well, it was the first time in my entire career that I got, I, well, I got blindsided, you know. Uh, I got laid off along with a bunch of layer, another layer of, of, of management. And uh, instantly that company made in one, on one Monday, uh, they saved about, I don't know, two and a half million dollars a year uh, by one transaction, me and a bunch of others um, were out of work which was like strange, but it was, because usually I know, usually I'm helping them, but uh, this happened. So I have my bachelor's in hand. I'm here at the church, you know, I'm 14, 14 I was here. So I mean, I'm, all this journey, I'm here. So this thing about college, and I think Elliot stepped out, maybe he was still here in the first service, but in college, I, before I went to college in high school, and I asked my youth pastor, I said, hey, um, what, do you th what do you think about me going to college? And uh, I mean, he was serious too. I mean, it was like, it was scary serious. And I, and I was like, I was really respecting what he was gonna say. Like, I thought it was gonna be, you know, profound. He says, you know, um, he said, Jim, listen, I, I wouldn't waste my time going to college because Jesus is coming back in the rapture like tomorrow. And I said, I said, really? He, he goes, I, I don't want him to come back until at least I get married, you know? <laughs> I was like, you, I didn't, I, I didn't have any relationship. Well, Cindy's my only one and she will be, uh, till death do we part, you know? Uh, she didn't get the shout out, she's counting money. <laughs> oh, you're done. <laughs> um, so she's, uh, I got messed up. Oh. So the, be careful. Be careful of some of the counsel that you ask for people. You need to weigh it out. You need to weigh it out. I, I mean, I, took, I went back and told my dad, hey, I'm not going to college. I said, you know, the youth pastor. He said, the youth pastor is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but you have to know my dad, right? Got it on my dad. Uh, so it ended up going to school, doing all that, working for you know companies, doing good. Uh, served in every capacity, you know, board, Sunday school teacher, help with youth. I mean, at, at the church. So my mission really was was work outside, not go back to school. Like school was not go, it was not in the game. It wasn't part of the plan. Um, then this, then this m m big layoff happened. And I'm going like, no, now what am I gonna do? I think I was 49 or 50. Like, I like, I'm a late career guy. So I'm looking for work and of course I'm, you know, I'm a general manager, plant manager, I'm, you know. And I'm thinking, I'm really sick. You want, you want the truth? I'm really sick 
of working 70 and 80 hours a week, making millionaires more money. It really hit me. And what hit me was a trip I made to China and I was doing some outsourcing and I saw the exploitation of people that I've only, I've only read about, but I saw it firsthand of some of the most vile conditions and some of the worst working conditions that human beings have to do in order to satisfy American wants and needs. It was awful. It was a great trip, but it changed my perspective. I'm still working. I get laid off. From the, after that trip, I got laid off six months later. I'm in a transition. Like, what am I going to do? Am I going to get another job? You know, I got a house payment. I got car payments. I got, you know, I got, I got to go to Costco and spend that $200 a week because that's what you do when you go to Costco. Costco used to be $100 a week. <laughs> Let me give you a news flash. It went to $200. So, um, yeah, I, I got things to do. So, um, I came here. They needed, they needed some help. I worked here for a little bit. They offered me a job. I laughed at them at first. I went, what are you using? No. <laughs> one of the board members said, hey, you want to work here? Do what you do. Kind of come what I'm doing now. I said, oh, no, you can't afford me. <laughs> you, you can't afford. There's no way. I'm going to go get a job and you go find someone else to do this job. Oh, the Lord. He, she, he, the Lord in the dodgeball. He was nailing me. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, I was getting nailed for my cockiness and for my attitude. And, you know, I, he was bringing me down. And I needed it. Um, so I ended up working here as just a lay guy. I mean, just, just an employee. I, I, don't have, I wasn't Pastor Jim. I was just Jim. And... Uh, Right, Matt? Just Jim. How long have we known each other, Matt? 20 years almost? A long time. Anyway, uh, my journey is I ended up going back to school because the Lord told me to. Expand your knowledge. Expand where you are. Let the Lord, let the Spirit talk to you. i got a bunch of points, and I'm going to have to fly. But listen. You're never too young. Jesus was 12. And you're never too old. If you're thinking about school, if you're thinking about doing something else, if the Lord's got something going on in your heart, listen to the still small voice. Look at the crack in the door. It, the doors don't usually slam wide open. They're usually a little crack. A little light comes through, and you kind of have to push it a little bit. Because you've got to make some effort. Because it isn't just going to happen. you got, you got to do some effort. So long story short of my experiences, I ended up working here, getting our creden first credential. I wasn't going to be an ordained minister. No way. I didn't have pulpits. I didn't have no idea. I was scared to death of this seat right here. I, I, heard, I was sick this morning trying to think about preaching this morning. My stomach was upset. I mean, it's just, um, got my first credential. I got my second credential, which is a license. I said, oh, I'm good. I'm kind of, that's fine. That's, I'm good. Do you know you can't hardly serve in our, in our network without ordination, without being ordained pastor? Uh, you can't serve on any committees. You can't teach in the school of ministry. There's a lot of things you can't do. I went for my ordination. I'm telling you, I took every class and certified. I took every license class, and I took every li How many classes is that, Elliot? Like almost 30 classes. I'm in my 50s, and I'm taking these classes. Like, are you crazy? I should be working on my golf game, not... I got that. So now I have, the, I have this ordination thing, and I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. But don't you think you should be good at what you're doing? So that opportunity came to get a master's in theology. 
Now, I didn't want to learn Greek. I'm telling you. I didn't want to learn Greek. I, di I didn't want to learn Hebrew. I, so this, it's only God. Only God, right? This thing came up where it was a practical theology thing. I'm a practical guy. Practical theology. I said, oh, I'm, I'm in for that. How much is it? I can afford that. Uh, how long does it take? I can do that. I graduated about three years ago. Walk the line. So I was 58 when I graduated with my master's. Um, listen, you're not too old. You're not too old. Uh, use, your, use the stuff that God gave you. Um, I got three points. I know, it's tin till. You ready? You got your notebook out? Here we go. Number one, admit you don't know everything. Learn something new every day that will help build the kingdom. You can learn something new in, in your prayer life. You can learn something new in the word. Hey, pick this thing up once in a while. You know, dust it off. You know, open it up. Even if you don't even get into scriptures, at least read the commentaries. Get something out of this. And if you can't get it out of here, man, do it at break time on here. You know? Get something out of, get something out of prayer. Get something out of the word. Uh, help other people. When you start helping other people, you'll find out you don't know everything. Because they'll tell you you don't know anything. Let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Um, B, stay humble. Part of admitting you don't know everything is you, you have to stay humble. Because if you get too arrogant, uh, knowledge will do that to people. Knowledge will make your ego pop out like, like a pimple. <laughs> here, here, I know a little something. Pop, there's the ego. Be careful with your ego. Because knowledge is knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Good knowledge is power. Terrible knowledge is power. <coughs> Let the Holy Spirit work in you. Uh, staying humble. So stay humble. Love people. Love his creation. Staying humble. Have compassion. Have the compassion that Jesus had. Not just... Not just uh, with your family or your friends, but have compassion with people you don't know. Have compassion to, like Jesus' compassion. He, his, he, his heart melted for, his, for the people. Staying humble, being grateful. Man, just be grateful. Have a, have a sense of gratefulness uh, of God's mercy and grace. And stay focused on the mission. If you don't have a mission... You don't have a target to hit. Stay focused on your mission. That could be internally. What are you going to do? What is God telling you to do? What's God telling you to do? Not what is everybody else telling you what to do. That, that, happens, in, that happens right now, right? That's where we live. We take everybody else's input. We mix it up in this big pot and see if we can fit into it. That isn't what God called us to be. God called us to be the salt and the light of the earth. And it's only you. And so you have to decide that. And how you decide that, you decide that how the Spirit is speaking to you. So focus on the mission. Also, marvel at God's mysteries. Marvel at his creation. I mean, how can you go to sequoias and not be marveled at the size of those trees? Or go to the beach or go to the mountains. Just marvel at his creation. Um, Marvel is at the mystery of God and his unmerited favor. He loved you while you were yet a sinner. That's crazy. I, I, I hardly like people who like me. How, how do I love people who hate me? See, you're listening. I like that. I like that. Come again. Oh, you weren't listening, Jose? I said, I hardly like people who like me. And they laugh. They thought that was funny. 
he loved us when we didn't deserve we hated him we despised him and he loves us don't you think that's pretty that's a pretty cool mystery of god his forgiveness how about his promises Joshua 1 9, he says he'll leave, he'll, he, would, he would never leave us. In Jeremiah 29 11, he says he has our future. And then John 14 3, he gives us the promise of eternal life. John 14 3, he says he's going to take us, he's going to heaven to build a mansion for me. So when I die, I have a place to stay right next to him. So not only does he promise me, a good life here, a perfect life. What's a perfect life? I'm telling you, there's. Pastor Elliot just talked about it. It's a journey. You're going to have valleys. You're going to have mountains. You're going to have great times, and you're going to have sorrow. But God's in it, and He's with you all the time. Second point: willful, willful ignorance is not an excuse. Willful ignorance is a law term. It's a decision in bad faith to avoid becoming informed about something as to avoid having to make undesirable decisions about that information. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a child of the 70s and you remember Richard Nixon, it's called plausible deniability. How many remember plausible deniability? Man, the crowd's getting thin. I don't, I don't know, I don't want to know, because if I know, then I have to tell the truth. I have to do something about it. Plausible deniability. Or, more simple, more practical term, would be, I like my views, and I don't want the facts or the truth to get in the way. I like my views. I hold my views precious, and I don't care what the truth is, and I don't care what the facts say. That's plausible deniability. James 4, 17 says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. Ooh, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. Plausible deniability does not work in the kingdom. Uh, because you don't want to know doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The truth is the truth. God uses, God uses knowledge to expand us. He, he uses it to expand you. Uh, and he also uses it to reposition you. The repositioning, sometimes, it, sometimes he, the expansion isn't going from where you are and then moving outward from where you are, sometimes it's a repositioning of taking you out from where you are, moving you, and then expanding. He did that. He did that with Adam. He did it with knowledge. What was the name of the tree in the, in, um, in the Garden of Eden? The tree of knowledge. Was that tree good or bad? You talk to me. Was that tree good or bad? That, that tree was just neutral. It was a creation. But it was a tree that had instructions. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. And they touched it. And the repercussions of touching that tree opened up knowledge that they did not need to know. We'll speak that a little bit. Things you know that you should not know, that you need to get rid of. So not all knowledge is good. Not all knowledge. You think that was good knowledge to have Adam fail in the in, in Eden? He went from a place of paradise to the desert. He got repositioned and he got expanded, but not in the way that God wanted him to. Noah, God, God expanded his knowledge. Do you think Noah knew how to make an ark? I don't think Noah knew what an ark was. He didn't know what rain was, so how did he know what an ark was? Let alone how to build one. 
expanded his knowledge. Moses. Moses was running away from God. Moses didn't want anything else to do with God. He's out in the desert taking care of his fallen off sheep. He's playing dodgeball like me. Boom, missed me. It took a burning bush and it took the holy ground of, a, of sand, that he was standing in sand to know that he was on holy ground. And the realization in his heart that God was repositioning him. Moses was no longer able to tend his father lost sheep or goats or whatever he's looking at. He had to go back to Egypt. He had a mission. But it came from the heart, came from the spirit of God. God expanded the knowledge of Peter. Peter was a fisherman. A fisherman. Jesus comes around and says, hey, Peter, follow me. Well, he did, he, he did do that. He did, but he, when he met him, he was fishing. What happened to Peter's fishing business? Remember? Peter's fishing business. It went crazy. He followed him. I'll follow you anywhere, buddy. Man, if you can do that, I'll follow you anywhere. Expanded him. Expanded him to the point of he became the rock in which the church was built. Beyond Peter's wildest dreams. He never thought he would do that. Do you think Peter ever thought he would stand? He denied Jesus three times before he was crucified. And not too far not too far forward from that story, he's preaching after the infillment of the Holy Spirit and 3,000 and 5,000 and the church is being built because of what? Because Peter is being expanded by God. James, the brother of Jesus, did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. He was playing soccer with him. He knew Jesus. They thought Jesus was a pretty cool guy. He could do some really great miracles. But he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah until he learned something. What did, what did it take for James to become a believer, to become part of the pillar of faith? It took Jesus' resurrection. James was, was an unbeliever, and Jesus' resurrection turned him around. said, whoa, my brother Jesus is the Messiah, changed him. Paul, Paul was the most learned guy there was. He had all the knowledge of, the, of, a, of, a, of a learned scholar. He was a Pharisee. He knew his stuff. Uh, Paul tells us in... Um, Paul tells us Paul tells us I am indeed a Jew born of Tarsus of Caesarea but brought up in this city at the feet of Grimmel I am a smart guy but then he turns around and says let me make known to you brethren this is in Galatians that the gospel which is preached by me is not according to man. For neither was it conceived from man, nor was, it, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul had to unlearn all that he learned. Because what he knew was causing destruction. His, his learning at the at the feet of Gramil resulted in the death of Christian believers. That's what he did with that knowledge. Killing Christian believers. His goal in life was to annihilate this young faith in its infancy before it got root. Because he knew, he knew if something, this thing could go crazy if he didn't take care of it quick. Boy, didn't he know. It took, a road, it took a road to Damascus ride for God, for Christ, to knock him off his horse, basically his high horse, and, and, and 
get him humble, blinded his eyes, and gave him a revelation that he would never have gotten. It came from the Holy Spirit. Get some godly examples in your life. John the Baptist, Paul, there's a bunch of them. An uncle, a brother, a dad, a mom, a pastor, a youth pastor, a music pastor, a friend. Get some godly examples in your life. Once you get that, you've got some targets to hit. You've got some goals to make. When you're expanding your knowledge, be sure that you intersect the Holy Spirit in it. The Holy Spirit has got to have a place in your accumulation of knowledge. Because if you don't use the Holy Spirit, your knowledge is for naught. What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Well, let me tell you. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. You can know everything, but do you know how and what to do with it? It takes wisdom. Wisdom's not the same as knowledge. Knowledge is the acquiring of information. Wisdom is knowing what to do with it. As we close, number one, we review. Admit you don't know everything. Admit it. It's all right. You can say it out loud. I don't know everything. Maybe you want to say it soft because maybe the person next to you thinks you know everything. Maybe you want to just kind of say it to yourself. But I, you don't know everything. So learn something new every day. Don't be complacent. This, this thing of being willfully ignorant, it's a sin. It's a sin. Number three, find examples, both biblically and real life. I'm telling you, real life examples are way cool because you can talk to them. You can get all the, all the biblical examples you want, but I can't talk to Paul. I can't talk to James. I can't talk to John the Baptist. I can't talk to him. Man, but I can talk to Pastor. I, I can talk to you. Get those examples. And lastly, let the Holy Spirit do His work in your life. We're Pentecostal. Why are we Pentecostal? Because we love the experience of what the power of God can do. Whether it be for healing, whether it be for salvation, but we love to see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in the life of our people in the lives of those who we don't even know, the Holy Spirit. Remember, when you're speaking, you're speaking with your accumulated experience, both educational and, and life, practical life experiences. Be careful. Be sure you lift people up. It is so easy in our culture now to be so down. If, if you don't have a response that is, that is snide or, or mean, it's like you're not with it. It's like you're not, you don't have it. Um, be kind and be loving. Be gentle. Love. Acquire knowledge. And be useful with the knowledge. Just don't get it. Get it and use it. Get it and use it. Hey, let's stand. Let's uh, let's pray us out. And I kept you over a little bit, but not much. Hey, let me give you a real quick word of advice. Don't play dodgeball with God too much, because He has a pretty good He got a pretty good shot. So, Lord, we ask you to take these words, this expanding our knowledge, God, and take it to heart. Lord, we love you, and we know that all good things come from you. Lord, give us the wisdom of how to use the knowledge that we have. And Lord, help us unlearn some of that stuff that we've already learned. 
that's not useful for the kingdom, that's actually negative and, and uh, mean-spirited. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to give us a, a sense of, of faith uh, that our knowledge is useful for the kingdom building and then for the people that are around us. Lord, bless this church. Bless Pastor Steve and Karen as they're taking some time off. Um, bless our week. And we ask you, Lord, to, uh, to, to let your light shine in us that we can be a light unto the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.